Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. I'm here today with Dennis Mangan, more commonly known as PD Mangan out on Twitter and everywhere else who's written a book which I read and I was fascinated by, and it's called Dumping Iron. And it's all about the importance of your iron status in the body. So I'd already researched iron because I had a high iron problem many, many years ago when I started researching disease. And then I got Dumping Iron and it gave all the answers. So hey, Dennis, first time we've talked face to face, delighted to be here and talk to you. Uh, thanks, Ivor. I'm I'm delighted to be here too. I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of yours. I I think the work you're doing with uh, raising awareness of the real causes of heart disease is incredible. I'm 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 um, I, I'm a big fan of that. I love it. Hey, thanks a lot, Dennis. But to be honest, we've riffed a lot out in Twitter and elsewhere, and had some great fun. I read your book and it was it was just fascinating to me because just briefly I had very elevated ferritin around 530 and high gamma glutamyl transferase six, seven years ago. The doctors couldn't give any guidance and I started researching and I found out, wow, ferritin and everything to do with iron balance in the body is huge. Uh, and then it was afterwards I got your book and I just it was just unbelievable going through it because I had loads of papers on elevated ferritin and metabolic syndrome. And I thought I had most of them you should have. And then I read your book and I said, wow, everything is in here. So maybe we'll start off talking a bit about this for the kind of lay person. Uh, just going through all the stuff around iron in the body, the measurements of iron the pathological significance of iron and just just go through kind of all of it okay um so iron is a required nutrient every every, every we all need it to live and and virtually every living organism needs iron and uses it as as part of the biological system so we must have it and historically speaking or in evolutionary terms i should say um, uh, we've lived in an iron scarce environment. So we, we have, uh, human beings have developed a, a, a way to grab as much iron as we can out of the, out of the environment, which is our food and to hold on to it. Uh, but because of the, the scarcity of iron in our environment, we do have, we have no regulated way of getting rid of iron. So in theory, um, we are able to absorb iron from our food and regulate it by increasing or decreasing the absorption of iron. But once you've got it in you, it's very difficult to get rid of. So uh, women, due to the menstrual cycle, have much lower iron levels on average than men. Um, so what happens is that by about the age of 18 to 20, when, when both sexes are at, have reached the age of maturity, uh, the iron levels in men starts to, start to rise until by the age of, uh, by middle age, men typically have four to five times the level of iron in their blood as women do. And they also have four to five times the risk of heart attacks and of cardiovascular disease than women do at that age. So this fact led the late uh, Dr. Jerome Sullivan to wonder whether, gee, you know, iron could be playing a role here. Uh, until that time, it was thought that the difference in disease rates in middle-aged in heart disease rates in, in middle-aged men versus women was due to estrogen or other hormones, perhaps. And Dr. Sullivan uh, came up with this idea, this hypothesis, that it was in reality the higher iron levels of men that was causing the higher heart disease rates. 
And he worked on this idea for the rest of his life, uh, publishing many, many papers. So um, iron is measured as the, the protein ferritin. So ferritin is a protein that human beings and other organisms have that controls iron because iron is a very reactive metal. So you don't want it running around loose inside your body because it reacts with all kinds of other molecules that are in the body, oxidizes them, and in general is really bad news. Um, so you have this protein ferritin that holds iron within its core and um, keeps iron safe so to speak. So uh, ferritin, is, ferritin is a measure of stored iron. And if you get a ferritin test, which is a relatively common lab test uh, done in all clinical laboratories, you can tell how much body iron you have. Um, now, iron, uh, let's see, I'm not sure uh, <laughs> which way I should go in this story. So iron is implicated in all kinds of other diseases. It's since been found. For example, uh, brain disorders like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Iron is implicated in, in both of those. Uh, it's been implicated in cancer, in heart disease, like I mentioned, in diabetes. So basically a wide swath of chronic diseases, iron is implicated in all of them. So by implicated, I mean it's strongly suspected that they're playing a role, how, you know, how definitive that role is, how strong a role is, this is all continuing to be investigated and researched. Now, now uh, ferritin, the fer getting back to the ferritin test, there are normal ranges for ferritin, just like there are for any laboratory test. And normal ranges uh, for any laboratory test are done by finding out in, in which range 95% of the normally healthy population falls. So uh, when you look at ferritin, you find that there's a range of something like 30 nanograms per deciliter all the way up to, depending on which laboratory you ask, 300, 400, even 500 uh, nanog uh, milligr it's nanograms per deciliter, excuse me. Um, so the problem is, is that this normally healthy population, this, this so-called healthy population is reali in, in reality is subject to lots of chronic disease. Um, they, have, they have a high risk of chronic disease, as we know. Um, you know, many, many, many middle-aged and middle-aged people and up have chronic diseases. By, by the time people are 70, it's something like 90% of the, of the population in the United States has some chronic disease or other. So these normal ranges of ferritin are not accurate in the sense that if somebody, if somebody had, let's say, a 250 uh, ferritin level, this shows up as normal on a laboratory test. And a doctor would very likely say nothing about it. He, he would think that's normal, that's fine, you're good to go. Um, however, there's good evidence that a ferritin level anywhere above 100 is, is associated with health problems. So uh, this, this work has been done by, uh, much of this has been done by Dr. Leo Zakarsky, who's at Dartmouth University, um, who, who's a brilliant researcher, who's done, done a lot of this work on iron. And uh, one of his most recent papers is to the effect that they figured out that a normal range for ferritin shouldn't be any higher than 100 for optimal health. So, People, um, people have the, these uh, ferritin levels, let's say between 100 and 500. At the Mayo Clinic, I believe, their normal range goes up to 500 uh, ferritin level for men. So people have these normal ferritin levels. They may have some kind of problem, health problem that nobody can figure out, but nobody's looking at the iron at the ferritin level because it looks normal. Now. 
a ferritin level much higher than 500 may get looked at. Um, although, you know, I, I talked to someone just recently who had a ferritin level of 700, I believe it was, and he, he could not get any, any doctor to take him seriously to do anything about it. They just said, don't worry about it. That's not a problem. Um, so e even, even a level that high, which is frankly abnormal, um, doctors may not care much about um, hemochromatosis is a genetic condition that uh, when people have this, they absorb iron much more readily than others, and they can get very high uh, ferritin levels into the thousands. Doctors will take that seriously. Uh, and, and hemochromatosis is associated with an early death, uh, liver disease, all kinds of other things. This is what the very high iron does. So the, the treatment for that, for, for hemochromatosis, for a very high ferritin level, is therapeutic phlebotomy. Therapeutic phlebotomy is essentially the same thing as blood donation, only the blood doesn't go to a don donor, it, it is discarded. And also in therapeutic phlebotomy, um, blood can be removed much more often than uh, than for blood donation. So uh, a healthy blood donor can give blood at a blood bank a maximum of six times a year. And uh, whereas in hemochromatosis, um, depending, depending on the patient, it's up to the doctor to decide this, but they can have a phlebotomy as often as once a week. So that's, that's how they, they get the, the ferritin levels lower. If, if somebody has a phlebotomy, once a week and they have high iron levels, they will make up those red blood cells very quickly. Uh, iron, iron is a limiting factor there, whereas a, whereas a healthy blood donor may take several weeks to, to uh, replace the red blood cells that are gone. Um, so uh, there, there's an interesting, um, Dr. Zakarski had an interesting graph where he plotted average ferritin levels for men and women uh, in the United States. And uh, the ferritin levels, average ferritin levels reached a peak at uh, about the age of 65 for men. And then they declined down uh, quite a bit to up to the age of 90. Like I, I think the level at the age of 90 was about half. So, you know, so half of the peak. So what is the explanation there? Well, the explanation seems to be that the people with high ferritin levels are dying, leaving, leaving the lower ferritin level people to make up the average. So that's the explanation for this de declining ferritin level. Um, the, the Copenhagen City Heart Study uh, looked at ferritin levels and mortality rates, and they found a huge a, a very high mortality rate with people who had ferritin levels, I believe it was above 600, and decreasing mortality levels uh, at lower ferritin levels, although they didn't, they didn't look at, uh, I, th I think the cutoff was less than 200 or more than 200. If they had looked at less than 100, I feel pretty sure they would have found an even lower mortality rate than those at 200. But it, it was a, a linear relationship between ferritin levels and mortality rates. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.